ഓമ ജ്ഞാനത്തിനു ജ്ഞാനാനുജനാകാരി ചക്ഷുമുഹൂർത്തം വേണു തസ്മത് ശ്രീ ഗുരുവേ ഓം വിഷ്ണുപാദായ കൃഷ്ണ അഷ്ടാവിഭൂതന ശ്രീപുർ ഭക്തിവേദാന്ത സ്വാമി നാമ നമസ്തി സരസ്വതി ദേവൈ ഗൗരവാഹി പ്രചാരായ വിശേഷ ശൂന്യവാദ പാശ്ചാത്യദേശധാരി വഞ്ചാകൽപ്പതലോകശ്ച കൃപാസിന്ധുഭേദ ജയ ശ്രീ കൃഷ്ണ ചൈതന്യ പ്രഭു നിത്യാനന്ദ ശ്രീ അത്യുദ്ധഗത ശ്രീവാസാദി ഗൗരഭക്തമെന്ന് ഹരേ കൃഷ്ണ ഹരേ കൃഷ്ണ 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 ഹരേ 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 രാമ ഹരേ രാമ രാം രാമ So, I'll discuss today on not the specifics of the words of the first verse of the Nectar instruction, but I'll talk about some general principles uh, about the book and the position of this verse in that book. So, the Nectar of instruction is in Sanskrit, Upadesh Amrit. Now, the Goswamis of Vrindavan, they were the primary disciples of Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. and chaitanya mahaprabhu uh, he provided his teachings primarily through them and we are all a part of the uh, gaudiya vaishnav movement which is comes from chaitanya mahaprabhu and in this particular book he gives the practicals so it's interesting when he is giving the practicals how does he manage it so can you envision they are living in vrindavan and vrindavan is the capital of devotion it is the abode which is the which is the place where radha krishna pastimes are being eternally discussed eternally relished eternally enacted and at that place they are charting out a pathway for people in general especially devotional seekers to enter into that topmost realm so the books of the goswamis were actually team efforts the goswami would every day come and discuss there are there's a place in vrindavan dham where the goswamis would usually discuss and then they would go separately to their bhajan bhajan kutis their places of solitary meditation and there they would contemplate pray chant and write now they themselves are at the very elevated levels of consciousness and from that elevated level of consciousness they are outlining how we can attain that level so at one level those who are vrindavan they talk about braj bhakti just now radha and krishna we are absorbed in that and they begin with something which seems very basic very primitive primitive now vacho vegam manasah krodha ve jivha vega udaro pasthan etan vegan yo vishahet dhirah sarva apimam prathvim sushishya so the those who can control that and jivha vegam all of us have urges sometimes a strong feel to speak something but there are people you know, they are like babbling books that means you now whatever enters their eye gate and ear gate has to come out of their mouth gate within 30 seconds <laughs> and then 30 seconds don't pass <laughs> this this keep that keep that keep that so there are people who just keep keep talking keep talking we call them chatter boxes <laughs> so now speech is an important means of communication but speech can also be a major factor for distraction so we need to see chatter 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 and often it's not of consequential subjects then our attention gets distracted from consequential subjects either it's internally or what is more important for us or externally or the important thing that we're supposed to do In today's world, this vacho vegam, the earth to speak, 
comes out through text messaging. I saw one uh, video like as if 500 people are sitting on a platform, uh, sitting on a relay platform, and not one of them is looking at the news. Everyone's on their phones. So what is happening? That the same urge to speak is now being verbalized through text messages. So of course there are many text messages which are valuable, which can convey important communication. But many are not. So this is the urge to distract us. The mind renders here and there. And uh, that can just make us so restless. And then crowd away. Crowd is fury, anger. And this we see today everywhere in the world. Some men there is road rage. The people they are angry. And on the road, suddenly they just run over someone, they shoot someone. Do all sort of crazy things. You know, birds of anger. Jiva Vegam, Jiva Vegam, Udaro Pastavi. So Jiva refers to the town. So that is people. People are often caught by their tongues. And one of the problems I read in the US Army is that the young people, children, are eating so much that they are ob- so obese that the US Army is not able to get enough fit people to join their army. <laughs> Because the young people are so obese. <laughs> Just keep it, keep it. That's what happened in China also. China had the policy of one or none. They, they had only one child or no child. Hmm? So then one child they would have, because China had a traditional culture, and the whole family would pamper that child. And the child would become so obese. It's a big problem. So, in a sense, with technology, what is happening is that the devices, the devices are becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. And the people using those devices are becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> <laughs> so that is Jiva Vegam. Just eat it, eat it, eat it. And Udara Upastha Vegam. Now Jiva and the Udara is belly. The difference between the urge of the tongue and the urge of the belly is the urge of the tongue is to just eat delicious foods. And the urge of the belly is to eat a lot. Now, what is the difference? In one, uh, one it's, it's excessive selectivity, the other is excessive quantity. So, I think we just go, oh, I soon need this. And I sometimes people go from literally one part of the other part of the country, one part of the country to another part of the country just to eat one night. So that's what the Jiva Vegam is. Udara Vegam is this gorge. Some people treat their tongue like a conveyor belt. <laughs> Lots of things go inside that. <laughs> <laughs> so, there are upasthavegam. Upasthavegam is of course genitals. Sexual urge. That is something which is parovinism. And uh, today, through the internet, all sorts of images are so easily available that often, uh, you know, reaching out for a piece of bread it requires today more effort than reaching out to see some obscenities. So at least to get a bread, you have to go up and walk to the fridge. To see some obscenities, just click a few buttons there and there. So people are just caught. And I found that, I read and wrote an article about this pornography, that the money in the pornography industry is actually five times more than the money in football league, baseball league and basketball league. All combined together. It's astronomical. So people have been caught, caught by the urge or urge of the senses, especially the sexual urge. And Ethan Vinga and you know, which is the And one of that wise person who can control these urges, who can tolerate these urges, which I Sarvam Apima to the Shiksha. Such a person can actually. Uh, become, uh, have, have decided all of the world. Now, interestingly, if this word, if this book is for seekers, why are the qualifications of a spiritual master who can have disciples all over the world itself? And there are multiple reasons. First is that the seeker also has to search for an appropriate spiritual master. Uh, and 
person should have these qualities. Secondly, the seeker also should know that I have to become like this person. And these are the qualities which I need to develop. And thirdly, that the seeker needs to know that these are so important. Because on the path of devotion, sometimes when people think that actually what is important is devotion. I love Krishna. I think I chant Krishna's name, I dance in front of him, I love the deities. I am a devotee. These are very important things, no doubt. But so you can have basically there is in the process of bhakti there are two aspects. So you see how Krishna and Maya. Maya is the force of music. The A is attached. B is detached. So now there are four possibilities here. You consider somebody can be somebody can be detached from Krishna and attached to Mount. These are the materials. They don't care about Krishna. They care only about worldly enjoyment. Now, now the second kind of people are those, we have just four categories of people here. People here are devotees. What is that kind of a secret? The opposite of materials. Attached to Krishna, attached to Krishna. And there is another category of people. They are the impersonists. The impersonists are those who have an impersonal conception of God. They think that any person conception of the impersonal is high. And they think that they go beyond the personal to attain the impersonal. So, some, I saw once a t-shirt, which I, as soon as I had to a t-shirt, I was an atheist. Till I discovered I was God. <laughs> <laughs> so they think that the conception of God is there, you have to go beyond that to merge into the infinite absolute. So they, they think they have to go beyond God. Some of the impersonal things are detached from the material world. So they are detached from Maya, but their problem is they are detached from Krishna also. <laughs> they think they want to go beyond Krishna or something else. Hmm? And then the last category of people are called Sahajiyas. Sahajiyas are the sentimentalists. Sentimentalists, they are attached to Krishna, but they are attached to Mayas. Such people. They, they may chant Krishna's names and they may actually have a lot of devotion to Krishna. In the sense that they very effusively do devotional activities. When they chant, they pray, they do the same thing. They hear about Krishna, they see about Krishna, tears come from their hands. So many of them may have some attachment to Krishna. And certainly there is some emotional connection that they have with Krishna. But they don't follow any process. And because they don't follow any process, what happens is their emotional spurts sometimes come. Sometimes they feel so connected to Krishna. Other times they feel, they feel dragged by it. So they don't follow any discipline. They don't follow any regulatory principles. They don't try to cultivate the detachment from the senses. They think that Sadhguru is also okay and Bhakti is also okay. So they are attached to Maya and they are attached to Krishna. And especially Vrindavan, we find a lot of people of this category. 
So Rupa Goswami, right in the beginning of this world, right, is differentiated. This is not the kind of people you want to be. It's good to be attached to Krishna in whatever way is possible. But the serious devotees also cultivate detachment from Mahatma. And this verse highlights that point. Right? What, are, how are the, how, what are the ways in which we get attached to Maya? So we have to the to six forces I described. The, <coughs> the speech, the mind, the anger, the tongue, the belly and the nose. And these are the ways in which we get attracted to the, uh, to the form, to the illusory objects in this world. And thus we get attracted. So, as we move forward in the steps, we will see that it goes to exalted levels of spiritual devotion. But it begins with the Sangha. So in a sense, our growth in bhakti is a journey like this. You know, we, we, we divide it as from Krishna, we want to become attached to Krishna. So why like this? Not the, our journey, actually the NOI, the nectar of instruction is going like this. It begins with verses that describe detachment from matter. And eventually it will describe verses that talk about great attachment. Where Ishtam Vajet Ranurag Yanam Dam Kalam Naye Tilam Itti Upadesh Saram Ajnazan Dam Constantly absorbing God and Krishna. And he says, the name of this book is Upadesh Amrit. And then he says, what is it? Itti Upadesh Saram. This is the essence of the the essence of instruction that I can give you. So the point is that attachment to Krishna is important. At the same time, detachment from material things is also important. And uh, uh, to differentiate between serious devotees and sarajya, sentimental basis. The focus here is on starting with attachment. Now, Srila Prabhupada, and before this, the Bhakti Siddhanta is happening. Spiritual master Shri Prabhupada, when they presented Bhakti, they focus a lot on this of detachment from Bhakti because the, the Sahajiyas had proliferated. And the Sahajiyas, they were doing all kinds of immoral activities, and at the same time, they were claiming to be devotees. In that way, they were giving devotees a bad name. Now, anybody can practice devotion. The doors of devotion are open to everyone, no doubt. So somebody might be smoking, somebody might be drinking, somebody might be taking drugs. They can also chant the They can also come in the temple, they can also keep to keep them. The doors of bhakti are open for everyone. At the same time, they have to know, people have to know that this is not what devotees are. Even these people can become devotees. But what are devotees? Devotees are people who are morally exemplary, spiritually pure. The Prabhupada said, how can people know each other? So they are perfect people. That means all these uh, all these unhealthy behavioral patterns, they are not there in them. And Rupa Goswami stresses that over here, right in the beginning, that we need to break free from them. So how do we go about breaking free from this? The important thing is that again it is it is the process of bhakti that enables us to break free from this. So the more we start connecting with Krishna, the more that connection gives us inter- intelligence and peace. So what does devotion give us? We start practicing bhakti. Devotion gives us intelligence and it gives us peace. Now, the intelligence enables us to know what is right and what is wrong, what is beneficial and what is harmful. Hmm? So, by this, it becomes clear this is not good, this is good, this will help me grow, this won't help me grow. And the taste enables us to become attracted to that which is good and to avoid that which is bad. And generally, the intelligence comes first. The taste will take some time to come. So, uh, while the taste is not yet come, during that time, we have to act at the level of our intelligence. And that is why scriptural study is very important. 
when you study the scripture, understand the philosophy regularly, uh, then our intent is sincere. And then he is harmful. This is short sighted. This is far sighted. This is mundane. This is transcendental. The capacity to differentiate is the characteristic of intelligence. In general, you know, how will we know that any person is intelligent? Whichever field it is in. No, if it's a good doctor, it will be low. No, the doctor sees some symptoms. Oh, this symptom is not in this disease, it means this disease. This symptom means that this is not that disease. So basically, by seeing certain things, the doctor is able to discern. So discerning is the sign of intelligence. And that is it's, it's in every field. Somebody is an expert car repair car person. Now the car makes a particular kind of sound. Mm-hmm. And then this indicates the problem is in this car. The car is another point, point of noise. And then you say the car problem is the same as car. You know, if our if our laptop is not working, when we go to expert, you know, we may look at the laptop, then we look at the laptop. Mm-hmm. Okay, what do you mean? Oh, okay, you are after it's very slow. If it's very slow, you are running this this, this program. That means this is the problem. So basically, this is not disease. That capacity to discern is required in every walk of life. And intelligence, intelligence in any walk of life means the capacity to discern, to discriminate, to understand what works and what doesn't work. Now, this is what is developed by Bhakti. By studying the philosophy of Siddhanta by Vyakite Nakare Alas, Vyakite Krishna Lagi Sudrudha Manas. In the Chaitanya Charitamra, they said that, think we all this is philosophy, I am not interested in this. Don't think like this. The philosophy will help us to know what is the reality and what is not the reality. And that way, you will be able to fix the mind of Krishna. Vyakite Krishna Lagi Sudrudha Manas. So, in the word philosophy actually means feeling, feeling is love. So force is truth. So love of truth. And Krishna is the ultimate truth. So therefore, if we consider this point, that philosophy is love of truth, and Krishna is the ultimate truth, then philosophy's perfection is in love for Krishna. And that's how... <laughs> <laughs> So the topmost philosopher will be a devotee. And Krishna says, Bahunam Yamanam Ante Yanavam Maam Prasadhi Vasudeva Sarvamiti Samatma Sudarlaha. It's after many lifetimes of doing some kind of spiritual activity, the wise soul is trying to understand that Krishna is everything. That Krishna is the all and all. Krishna is the embodiment and fulfillment of everything attracted in this world. And therefore, I wholeheartedly devote my thoughts. So this understanding is what comes by the practice of devotion in the form of nourishing our intelligence to, to spiritual study. So here, <coughs> when the intelligence is strong, we can stick to the right, stick with the right and avoid the wrong. And gradually when the taste comes, then with that taste, we can move on and naturally gravitate toward that which is beneficial and stay away from that which is harmful. So let's quickly uh, I'll look over these six characteristics once again and then we can have some question answers. So I started with Vacho Vegam, the urge to speak. There are, uh, in this set of in this verses, the tongue is actually using twice. First, it is mentioned uh, Vacho and the urge to speak, and then Jiva. The time is mentioned with respect to eating. So, both these are functions of the senses. So, basically, we interact with the world in two ways. We take in information and we bring out action. For example, if I see an insect moving along the coming towards me. Then, that is the, I'm taking that information through my eyes. And then afterwards, 
I don't want to interest you now. I might just get some a broom or something. I'm sorry to tell you. That's the action level. So we interact with the world through taking information and then bringing it in out action. So the, there are five senses which deal with taking in information. They are called the Jnan Indriyas. And there are there's a knowledge acquiring senses, which are the you know, eyes, ears, ears mm-hmm. nose, touch, touch mm-hmm. tongue, tongue, tongue also. So you take it, you taste food. How is it? These are five knowledge acquiring senses. And then there are five uh, five action executive senses or action senses, karma indriya, which are the hand, legs, yeah, the two excrete your the genital and the uh, anus, and then speech is something we do with our hands and legs, and something we get done with our speech. So uh, uh, judge may say, let this person be hand. Let this person be, uh, be compensated. But that speech is itself something that is an action. In the sense that it will lead to action. So now, uh, Rupa Goswami here talks about uh, some of the senses. So, first one is Vacho Vega, the urge to speak. So, this is how we interact with the world in terms of making our voice heard. Making our presence felt, making uh, making uh, our opinion uh, manifest. Now, it is important. So actually, speech is a very important faculty which we are living have. and it is remarkable how much transformation can be done to people by the power of speech. We consider the some of the greatest leaders in the world. If you know, consider Hitler. What do you do? Just by his features, he changed the world view of an entire nation. And he had them filled with ambition about conquering the whole world, notion that they were the greatest of all races. And he, he incited them with hate for the Jews and others who were considered, who he considered primitive races. So all that happened by the power of speech. So when it is said, you control the urge to speak, that doesn't mean that we don't speak. It simply means that we recognize that speaking is a great power. And therefore it needs to be carefully used. Now if somebody has a very powerful bomb and they want to construct a construct a road in a mountainous area. Then they have to blow up some boulders. And then they use that uh, bomb to blow up that rocky area so that they can clear the road. But if instead they blow up that uh, bomb somewhere just on a normal road, normal ground, now all that they do is they create a crater over They create a big hole in the ground and it serves no purpose. It doesn't fulfill the purpose of constructing the road. Worse still, if they blow up that bomb, in a civilian area, where people are there, they kill people also. So, so, a bomb is a power and it needs to be properly used. So similarly, speech is a very great power and we need to properly use it. So, we could just fritter it away uh, and just idle chit chatting, or we could harm ourselves by speaking with harm others and harm ourselves. By humor mongering, by gossiping. Later on, it was not talk about Pajanka. So speech is a great power. And that power of speech, okay, like a power of a bomb, needs to be used to dismantle our own illusions and the illusions of others. When we are not careful about our power of speech, then we use it. We don't use it, we dissipate it. So, watch your way. So, just because I feel like speaking, I don't necessarily have to speak. Now, most often, if we just uh, 
if we guard our speech, we can, uh, and we can save ourselves a lot of trouble. We can actually recognize. And it said that, that the tongue has no bones, but the tongue can break bones. <laughs> <laughs> You may speak some things, they will make people so angry, they will come and beat us up, you know, they will break our bones. <laughs> or sometimes the tongue can also break hearts. When you speak something, yeah, and people can shut their words. The tongue has great power. And here we are talking about tongue's power of speech, so watch your wake. And Shatropa explained that the best way to tap the power of speech is by speaking about. Krishna is all powerful, he's all pure. So when you speak about Krishna, we become purified and we help purify others. So some people think that we should just be silent. And that's how we curb the power of speech. But that is very difficult too. On the other hand, uh, now some of us may like to speak a lot, some of us don't like to speak a lot. Maybe by nature a little bit more reserved, whatever it is. The important thing is that we channel our nature towards Krishna. So, if we like to speak a lot, rather than speaking on mundane things, we read a lot, we hear a lot, and we speak a lot about Krishna. We like to speak a little, whatever little we see, we speak about Krishna. When we start speaking about Krishna, we start getting taste in that. And once we get taste, then we need to speak more. So, watch your reading, and manasaha. This is uh, the the urge of the mind. Mm-hmm. Imagine if you see somebody that is driving a car at high speed. And suddenly you might see movies or some uh, Superman kind of person just uh, suddenly comes down in front of the car and pushes the car. And the car is going high speed in one direction. Suddenly it starts going in an entirely different direction. It starts going in the backwards. And that person, you know, maybe their muscles are bulging out. See how powerful they are. So similarly, the mind has so much power. You know, we may be directing our thoughts in one direction. And we are thinking about one thing, we are doing one thing. And then suddenly, the mind says something, Tack! we start going in the entirely opposite direction. You know, at one moment, we may think, you know, I am going to do this. I made a resolution. Okay. I am going to do whatever it is. I am going to do this. And then next moment, find ourselves going entirely opposite direction. So the force of our intention is completely overpowered by the force of the mind's momentum. And when this happens, the force of our intention is overpowered by the force of the mind's momentum. That indicates how powerful the mind is. It's like it can turn a vehicle in the opposite direction. Fast moving vehicle. The same, now when this happens, how do we deal with it? The important thing is to know that we need to fix the mind on something, fix our consciousness, fix our thoughts on something which is bigger than the mind. People can be very cheerful and happy one moment, and the next moment, you know, one thought in the mind. Next one, you know, our heart is palpitating, you may get high blood pressure. And we are just about to punch someone with fists. <laughs> you have to say, no, what happened? What, what changed? That's the power of the mind. So we have to be very careful in the with the mind. And the mind's force is the first thing we as seekers recognize. When we especially try to chant, when we try to meditate, when we try to fix the mind on Krishna, we immediately realize how powerful the mind is. How to focus, it focus your mind is going here, going there, going everywhere. What do I do? So be careful. Just try to bring the mind on fixing Krishna, gradually it will become fixed. It will take a gradual process, and every day when you chant, what is happening is we are purifying the mind. And the mind's energy is being redirected to the So, uh, the 
same energy if the mind is going off in the opposite direction, it can start going in a favorable direction. Maybe the sleep practicing has to be consistent. And crawl the way. Crawl the anger. Now, they say anger is just one letter short of danger. <laughs> and anger is danger. The film is only one letter, D. And what is that D? That D is disturbance. As soon as we disturb by something, we become angry. And then that disturbance makes us into going to danger. So we can't avoid disturbances. Disturbances are going to be there. People will act in disagreeable ways. Uh, life may give us a lemon, as you say. Life will give us a rod. Sometimes we may ourselves act in stupid ways. But when these things happen, then what do we do? If we just give in to the force of anger, then we often make things worse. Normally, see, how does anger delude us? Anger, de anger deludes us by giving us a sense of power, a promise of power. So lust, for example, deludes us by giving us a promise of pleasure. Come on, do this, you'll enjoy. Anger deludes us by giving us a promise of power. But when you become angry, you know, you can beat the, beat everything out of this person. <laughs> Oh, you know, just give them a piece of your mind. And then you say, I'll put that person in that place. So with the anger, actually, allures us by giving us a promise of power. But anger is not a sign of power. It is a sign of weakness. Because when we become angry, we are letting circumstances control our emotions. There are certain situations which require strong actions. But those strong actions should be consciously chosen by us. They should not be impulsively triggered within us by circumstances. So when we become angry, the anger is actually a sign of weakness. That means this person does not have the capacity to process one's emotions better. That person does not have the capacity to choose one's actions for them. And that's why it's a good thing. So, and Krodha will come to you. Krodha is actually such that uh, we end up making things worse. Now, I'll give one example. If you can remember that, you can avoid anger for a bit. Hmm? Suppose we are walking along the road, maybe a, a forested path. And suddenly we find that the stung us. We look down, and we are snake in the river. I feel intense pain in the leg. And the snake is like, how dare the snake bite me? I will, I will kill it. I start running after the snake to pounce it, to pounce on it, and to pound on it, and to crush it, and to kill it. Now, and even if I catch the snake, even if I kill the snake, what am I doing? I'm killing myself. Because the more I'm running like that after the snake, the more the poison is going to my blood, it is going to reach my heart, it is going to reach my brain, it is going to kill me. So at that point, you know, saving myself is more important than getting evil. <laughs> So, sometimes we think that, you know, getting even is the most important thing in my life. That person did like that to me, and I'm going to do like this to that <laughs> The snake has bitten, bitten me, and so I want to go and beat the snake. But I kill myself in the process. The first thing that I need to do is save myself. So, save myself. I'll go. I'll get the, you know, get the poison out, cut, cut something, cut some, have a tonic, have a, have a Caught tied around my leg, get the poison out. Now, if that snake is a danger, we may have to kill it. Um, we may have to send somebody to kill it, we may ask them to kill it, or we may have to trap it and send it to some reserve territory or whatever. The snake has to be dealt with. But dealing with the snake is not the first thing that we need. 
Similarly, when somebody hurts us, getting even is not the first thing we do. It's important to do that, not just get, it, get even. But basically, uh, make sure that the person doesn't make it a habit to hurt others. Hurt me and hurt us. We have to, we have to make the person recognize the danger of harm upon their being and prevent them from hurting others. But that's not the first thing. The first thing to do is save ourselves. And saving ourselves means that we don't let anger control us. So that poison that has come into our system, we have to get it out. Similarly, we need to control our anger. And one of the best ways to control our anger is to look at the means that actually anger deludes us by promising strength and inducing weakness. You just recognize the way anger works, then you will not succumb to it. So, ultimately, when we ch- chant Hare Krishna and start practicing bhakti, we start understanding that Krishna is in control. And then, that vengeance is not my job. There is God, there is a system of karma. People will get their views. So understanding Krishna's controllership helps us to not overreact when people act wrong. When, when we think that we have to set things right. This person did wrong and I have to set things right. Basically, I am putting myself in the position of God and I am trying to give retribute to justice, retribute to justice, retribution, punishment as a compensation for having hurt. Now, that is, we are basically thinking we are God. We understand God is in control and everybody will get their due. Then, our focus is on choosing the best response, not on getting him. That's how. Uh, the practice of bhakti will actually, at a subconscious level also, at a conscious level, with the intellectual understanding of God's controllership, we won't focus on making that person right. We focus on our right reaction, right response. And at a subconscious level, okay, love, anger is the impurity. And the more we become purified, the more anger will stop from us. Now, jivha vegan udaro Give how we can the urge of the tongue. That is, here we are talking about what? Eating. Now, eating is a biological use. But sometimes eating becomes also a psychological drive. That means what? We often overeat because something is eating us. This anxiety is gnawing me. This anxiety is gnawing me. This loneliness is hurting me. This emotion is troubling me. And something is eating us up from within. So internally we are having that uncomfortable sensation. And we counter, we counter the inner discomfort of something eating us up with the outer comfort of eating something. So just telling people, don't over it. Just make a resolution, I won't over it. Yes, that helps. In the sense that, uh, that resolution at least is the beginning. But often, we over it because there are some unresolved emotional issues. And those unresolved emotional issues need to be dealt with. So sometimes food becomes like our comforter. You know, we eat uh, what is called as comfort food. Comfort food means, whenever I feel uncomfortable, this is going wrong in my life, that is going wrong in my life. Oh, I'm eating this chocolate, at least this is right in my life. <laughs> this chocolate tastes great. This one thing is right in my life. So when we eat food like that, as a, as a source of emotional comfort, then at that time, that food becomes a Food is actually meant to be the uh, nourisher of the body. But uh, when, so food 
is the nourisher of the body. But that same food can become the damager of the body. When we use it as an emotional comforter. Without addressing underlying emotional issues, uh, when we seek to comfort ourselves internally through the food we take externally, then we keep eating a lot because we want to get that comfort. Now, how do we deal with this? So, at one level, at a practical level, making sure that food, especially opulent fatty food, is not easily available for us. That is the thing. If I see a fatty, opulent food very easily accessible, it's just there in my drawer, it's just there in my pocket, it's just there nearby. Then, even without my realizing, I'm talking on phone, I'm just uh, maybe tapping something on my head, and my hand goes down and it takes the food and eats it. Hey, I suppose not, I'm not supposed to eat it. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> so, that happens because if we, so if something is uh, tempting us, and you know something tempts us, then better to keep it against us. Better to not keep it closed by you. So, <clears throat> in a sense, the more we can regulate access to food, the more it becomes easier to regulate intake of food. So, the more we regulate access to food, don't keep fatty food easily available. Then the easier it becomes to the regulate the intake of food. So now, actually, one thing, the big advantage with respect to eating food is that unlike other, other sense objects, food doesn't naturally flow into the senses. Now that means what? That, say, information constantly flows into the eyes. Sound flows into the ears, smell flows into the nose, but food doesn't flow into the stomach. Food doesn't flow into the mouth. No, we have to go physically and reach it. So that is the advantage. So it's not so easy to cut off access to other things. We can't move around with closed eyes. We can't move around with closed ears. We can't, we can't live with the closed nose. But uh, we have the capacity to regulate to close the mouth. We send that regulate access, regulate the entry of items into the mouth. And therefore, when we do that, then we can make it much easier. So it's, uh, it's actually, although the tongue is very difficult to control and it's urged to eat, in a sense, nature has provided us the capacity to actually control ourselves by the capacity to choose. So that's what you will do. Ultimately, when you take Krishna Prashad, that is the third thing that I will do. Udaro Pastavi from the earth in the summer. There is an old Egyptian saying. It says that uh, one fourth of you live on one fourth of what you eat. On the remaining of three fourths, you lose your position. <laughs> <laughs> the idea is most of us eat more than what is necessary. So, I will quote a uh, traditional Ayurvedic saying that whenever you feel, whenever you feel doubtful, should I eat or should I not eat? At that time, it's best not to eat. Because when we are hungry, we won't even get the doubt. <laughs> What do you want? I want it, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but when the body is in an ambiguous situation, should I or should I? That means the body has already gone. And basically, you are debating with the mind. mind, mind, mind. Yes, mind. So, what is happening? Whenever in doubt, say no. That's a safe way to deal with the urge of the doubt. And over a period of time, we ourselves learn how much we should eat. There is no need to artificially deprive our food. Mm -hmm. We need energy. And whatever it takes to get energy, we need to. Some of us may have huge appetites. And if after eating, we get energy and we are working, then others shouldn't consider such a person as an overeater. The 
point is not how much we eat. The point is what we do after we eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, the point is not how much we eat, it is what we do after we eat. So, if I eat a little, but after that, I go to sleep. Then that means maybe even a little is too much for me. I may have to, because generally, eating may cause a little harsh. So it's not that you need to sleep for hours after eating. Somebody may eat a lot and still may do a lot of work after eating. That means the body that digestion has the capacity to digest that much food. The body is using that much energy. So there's no need to compare how many, how much who is eating. The important thing is what is the effect on me of what I eat? Does it energize me? Or does it exhaust me? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, eating should energize us, not exhaust us. So, the quantity that will energize us and not exhaust us, that will vary from person to person. So, that's that, 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 this the urge of the genetics. A sexual urge is innate to humanity, the essential for the propagation of the human race. And in most species, there are few species that that reproduce asexual, but most species reproduce the sexual urges. So sex itself is an actual biological thing. The problem happens when it becomes a psychological obsession. When it becomes a psychological obsession, then we like it, we like it, we like it, we like it. Like it. And now to some extent, just the hormones which come and do, they make it a psychological obsession. But it is not just that. That natural agitation of the hormones which makes a male attracted to a female or a female attracted to a male. That causes a sensual drive for some time. But in today's materialistic culture, where we are constantly bombarded by sensual images. And that is what keeps provoking us. Now, what happens is the way we get provoked also varies. It means, say, in conservative cultures, where, say, uh, people cover their own. Then, even seeing a little flesh can agitate people. In cultures where people dress something, it is people may see a lot of flesh and still not get action. That does not mean that the people uh, in a culture where people dress something, they are sense control people. It is just that the stimulus for agitation is so common that the stimulus is called agitation. <laughs> <laughs> then, so, when a stimulus or agitation becomes common, then that stimulus doesn't cause agitation. Then those people get agitated by something else. It's not that they are not going to get agitated. But the agitation may come from something else. So, the agitation is always there. So what happens is, the more we are exposed to sensuality, some people may get agitated by this much exposure. Some people may get agitated by much more exposure. But the principle is not the kind of exposure, the, princi- well, the principle is the point fact of agitation. And so the exposure to sensuality is what causes agitation. And we have to find out how we can regulate that. Actually, Krishna is very specific that we do not blame others. When he mentioned off in third chapter about where lust is situated. He says, it is situated in the senses, the mind, and the things. Indriyani mano buddhi asya That means, he is not saying that lust is situated in the sense objects. He is not saying that we cannot blame others. You know, because of you I became lust. He can't do that. Why? Because, if, even if that person is in a particular way, but it is the lust that is present within us that is agitating us. You know, say that, um, if that person is a mother, and then that, uh, that person is carrying a baby on their body, that, 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 or a child on their body, the child is touching their private parts. The child is not getting agitated. We are getting agitated. Why? Because the last is within us. So we can't blame others. Now, last is created within us. And we need to purify us. 
A purification takes place. And during that period, what you need is regulation. But if I find out that a particular stimulus agitates me, then I keep the distance from the students as much as possible. And um, in this way, as we regularly dance is more and more. When we end that to something, we become purified. At a spiritual level, we understand that whatever is attractive in this world, uh, it's attractive in concentration. So, instead of getting attracted to the form of this world, we feel that for attraction to this question. And the, <clears throat> the urge for the urge for sensuality, for sexuality specifically, it is the urge which needs to be, it is a, it is a extremely powerful, it can devastate, and if it, it can devastate a person, it can devastate others, it can break society. The walls are taking place because you know, a king was attracted to particular princess or a man was attracted to a particular woman. So it's an it's extremely powerful force. At an individual level, how do we deal with it? Deal with it? So, so what happens is, we have to change our conception of dealing with lust. Sometimes, you know, when temptation comes, you see, tempt oh, now that desire has come, now I want to fall. So we see temptation as a precursor of defeat. Now that the desire has come, now I want to fall. But if we redefine temptation as an indicator of attack, but now I am being attacked. Now just because I am being attacked doesn't mean I have to be defeated. I can counter attack. I can fight. So, I can prove this example that say so suppose we are going on a road. Many of the roads, if you see on their sides, they have something like bumps, speed breakers. So what happens? Sometimes people may just while driving, they may nod off. So the the bumps on the side of the road, when we go on those bumps, what happens? People are nod off, nodded off. It's like, hey, they wake up. They pull back. Now just because they have gone on those bumps on the side doesn't mean that they have to fall off them. Just the jaws indicate that they need to come back. Similarly, when we are going on the path of moral and spiritual integrity, sometimes we just wear off course. And when, as long as we are well situated in Krishna Bhakti, we won't feel agitated by sensual desires. Because we are, we are busy in Krishna service. But when we stop being busy in Krishna service, then we become agitated. So basically what happens, we are going off course. So when we go off course, we jolt. So like that, when we get jolted by sensual desires, rather than thinking, oh, now I have to fall. We should think that, oh, this means I have gone off track. Let me come back on track. Let me come back on track. So rather than seeing the jolt as a sign that now I have to fall off. You see the joy, joy as a reminder, I have to turn back. So if we redefine, uh, re-envision temptation, not as a precursor to defeat, but as an indicator of distraction, as an indicator that something in me is now pushing me off track. Let me come back. And if we come back on track, we will find that we come back and come back. That the desire doesn't stay for long. Desire comes, we tolerate it, Say so sometimes it will be cool. In this way, we can deal with sensual desires also. So the process of bhakti, although I talk about detachment and this words focus on detachment, detachment from uh, the materialistic drive is important. But our focus should never be on detachment. Our focus is on detachment. This is what I'm going to do. And while doing this, I will avoid this, I'll avoid this, I'll avoid this. If we focus too much on saying no to things, it becomes very difficult because we feel deprived. We focus on saying yes to things, yes to Krishna. Then we can move onwards happily. Because connection with Krishna brings satisfaction, it brings purification, ultimately, it brings liberation. So I'll summarize. So I spoke about the 
first was the issue of the lack of instruction, how all of the manual for devotion written by the Goswamis, who were themselves relishing the highest sweetness of devotion in the highest reward of devotion. They, by charting the pathway, start in the basics. The reverse, uh, which is for seekers, talks about controlling the six urges. And such a person can be qualified to be a guru. We talk about the qualification for guru because the seeker needs to search for a person like this. The seeker needs to know this is what I need to become like. And the seeker needs to differentiate between authentic devotees and superficial or pseudo devotees. So we discussed about how materialists are attached to Maya, detached from Krishna. And the journey to a devotion is exactly the opposite, to become attached to Krishna and detached from Maya. But there are other variants that we have. If you have get an acquire an impersonal conception, then you become detached from Krishna, also detached from Maya. And that doesn't lead to a, a devotional liberation. The other danger is that we stay attached to Krishna Maya by, by imagining that they are attached to Krishna. So this, this misconception is shattered by having right in the beginning the emphasis on detachment. The, so the journey in the Uddeshamra starts from detachment in the initial verses and then goes on to exalted levels of attachment to Krishna. And we discussed about the six urges. So the urge to speak. Like people, some people like babbling groups to keep speaking and play the internet with its messaging culture. That, that has given way to the continuous talking, talking, talking. So it's a speech is like a power, like a bomb. It needs to be used to explode illusion, like a bomb used to explode boulders by building a road. If it is just dissipated uselessly, it simply create a crater. crater. Or it is exploded in a uh, crowded area, it will destroy it with its feet. So like that, the power of speech, if used properly to speak about Krishna and speak Krishna's message, then you hate it. It destroys illusions. Otherwise, it just perpetuates illusion. Or sometimes it can even aggravate illusion. We discussed about by the our focus is always on the practice of bhakti. And in practicing bhakti, we need to nourish our intelligence with regular exercise. So bhakti practice gives us intelligence and taste. Intelligence helps us to understand what is right and what is, what is beneficial, what is not. I have any kind of intelligence, be it mechanical intelligence, computer intelligence, medical intelligence, it, it is basically about differentiate. This is this is this indicate this, this indicate this. This is to be done, this is not to be done. So Taste means that which is healthy, we naturally want to do. And that is unhealthy, we don't want to do. Getting taste will take time. But we can definitely progress towards it by using our intelligence. And Jiva, Vacho Vegam, Arsa Krodi. Mind, I give the example of uh, a fast moving car moving the opposite direction. Like that, our intention can completely be reversed by the mind within one moment. And the way to control the mind is to fix it on something bigger than the mind, that is Krishna. And every day that we fix the mind on Krishna, even if the mind doesn't focus on it, we are redirecting the mind towards Krishna. Gradually, the energy will move towards Krishna. Then, Krodha, we discuss anger. Anger allures us by a sense of power. But, it is actually kind of So, uh, the way to avoid anger is to first recognize its modus operandi and then to recognize that when 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 I'm when I'm getting angry, the important thing is not to get even. The important is to refuse to get safe. The snake has bitten me. I don't have to beat the snake. I have to get the poison out myself. And then afterwards, I can use that appropriate. So, if you understand Krishna's controversy, then we don't think vengeance is my duty. And that is also makes it easier to give up anger. Then I talk about Jivhavi, like the urge of the tongue to eat. So we often overeat because something within us food. So food is a biological necessity, but when we become a psychological comforter, then we overeat and the food instead of being an erasure of the body becomes a damager of the body. So by addressing our emotional issues, by connecting more deeply with Krishna. We can, we can seek comfort in Krishna into the food and that's avoid the urge to overeat. 
then if you order, we tend to overeat per se. So, I talk about tongue seeks delicacy, seeks, tongue seeks special items. Tongue is about selectivity and the belly word is about quantity. So, no. each of us, we decide what is the right quantity, not by comparing with others, but by seeing the effect of eating us. Eating should energize us, not exhaust us. And all we discuss about upastha, and the genitals. Now today, because of the media, the people are caught literally by their sexual urge. So it's easier to surf uh, nasty images than even to get some bread. And so we have to be extremely careful. And mm, the we all have certain things which agitate us. We need to regulate the exposure to the stimuli. And then we need to direct our love towards Krishna. Mm -hmm. Knowing that whatever is attractive in the form of this world, that is present in its fullness in Krishna. So when <clears throat> love tends to attack us, rather than seeing, oh, now I have got this desire, therefore I'll have to do it. If you can say that, simply indicate that I'm going off track. It's like I was going on a road and I hit, I veered off course, hit the bumps on the side bumps, and to come back. If you have that attitude, then you won't get carried, you won't succumb to it. You know, start having five laps, and by becoming connected with Krishna, by becoming absorbed in Krishna, they become purified, they become satisfied, and they become Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions? What can I do? Yes, six ten. No, I don't know. Thirty ten. Yes. Well, it's a six ten, and it's the 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 she also wanted to meet me. So, she wants to meet you. I don't know. And we might be here if we're going to meet. Mm -hmm. Let's see if that works out. Let's ask if it works out. Let's see if the class works out. Yes. I'm extremely surprised because I'm surprised if that's true. And so forth, I'm doing a job for my community with the Shakti, Kantarada Shakti, Anupatha Shakti, and Anupatha Shakti. I'm just curious. Yeah, okay. So, where does the information about Shaktis come from? Vishnu Shakti Paraprokta, Chetra Vyakta Gadabara. This is from the Vishnu Puran. That Vishnu Shakti Paraprokta, that is the common name. Chetra Vyakta Tha Apara. That is Apara Shakti. Tatiya Karma Sanyaya, Tatiya Shakti Vichy. So basically there is, there is the there is the spiritual energy parashakti, there is the mental energy of parashakti and there is the tritya in between, which for, performs the activity, which does karma. So this is from the Vishnu Purana. You find in the Veda base if you have, there is a if you search for um, you find this verse. Uh, Vishnu Shakti, just search for the phrase Vishnu Shakti. Either we should blast him or otherwise we can uh, leave that place. So, it doesn't matter dealing with other person. Like, he has, he has 
like for the person has another voice mode. So how to uh, deal with that situation? Like he's uh, blasting the voice mode. We should present our anger, correct? Like to deal with the person. How to manage the situation? Like we are, we will get overwhelmed by the person and we will say, why? How can you say that this person? Why? So, oh, if we have to get angry when a Vaishnava is blasphemed, so how exactly does that anger work? See, any principle has to be seen in the light of the ultimate principle. The ultimate principle is always remember Krishna, never forget Krishna. Saravadhi Vishita Asu, Etairo Ekim Karam, Bhartav Vizitam Vishnu, Smartav Vinjapuchi. So, when, say, somebody is blaspheming a devotee, and at that time, it is said that we should become angry, but they also said we should remember Krishna. So we have to see uh, what basically the whole idea is that how can I best serve in this situation. So when a Vishnu is being blasphemed, we shouldn't think I have nothing like this. We should think I, I should have a mood of service. But now, how specifically to act in that mood of service? Even when I am to serve a particular devotee who is being criticized, I want to defend that devotee. But how do I do that exactly? Sometimes our intervention may make things worse. So we have to use our God-given intelligence to find out what is the best way to serve. In the two examples that Srila Prabhupada gives of uh, Arjuna fighting the Kurukshetra war and Hanuman Bani Lanka. In those two cases, the moral boundaries were very clear. This is wrong, this is right. And also, in that particular situation, it is very, it is very clear how they should be acting. But in our cases, sometimes the moral model themselves may not be very clear. Is this really wrong? Is this really right? Yes, this devotee is criticizing this devotee, but but maybe this devotee has done something wrong. Maybe I don't you know, to resolve the issue is important. And without doing that, we may not we may not act in a way that is helpful. And secondly. Uh, even when uh, the moral boundaries are clear, even after that, we have to clearly understand what we need to do. Otherwise, you know, we just uh, make an altercation bigger. So that's what happened in Dakshin Yagi. When Lord Shiva was disrespected, the assistants of Lord Shiva, they started burning the sacrifice, they started destroying the secret sacrifice. And then they cursed the other party, the other party cursed them, and the whole thing became a mess. So, uh, our reaction should be such that it is a service to Krishna. So sometimes, when the service for Krishna, service to Krishna calls for it, we can even use anger in Krishna's service. But we shouldn't automatically think that my anger is in Krishna's service. Or I am defending the devotee and I am very angry for that purpose. No, defense also has to be done in an intelligent way. Sometimes when there are soldiers, soldiers, they may have a lot of heroism, they may have a lot of patriotism. The soldiers also need discipline. You know, they may see some other, some enemy attack in a particular place. They just rush over there. But that might be a trap and they may die and their whole regiment will be destroyed. So, they, they, they have to defend the country, but the defense also has to be done not impulsively. There has to be an intelligent strategy too. So, when we talk about defending a devotee also, how to do it has to be decided intelligently. And then, we act appropriately. The principle is that uh, there is something called uh, there is the possibility of using anger in Krishna's service. But we shouldn't assume that my anger is being used in Krishna's service. We have to see whether Krishna's service is assisted by my anger or it is impeded by my anger. Okay. Yeah, good question. So, if some emotional unresolved issues are eating us up, and that's why we are already, what is the solution? The ultimate solution is 
that we need to get emotional fulfillment through our connection with Krishna. We, by our practicing bhakti, we connect with Krishna, we feel sheltered in our relationship with Krishna. And that's how we deal with these unresolved emotional issues. Ultimately, you know, immediately or intermediately, we may need to do something practical. Okay, if you don't feel lonely, you know. Okay. But this food is solution to loneliness. What other solutions can I have to loneliness? Maybe I can talk with one meet a friend. Maybe I can call someone. Maybe I can write my memories of a friend who is no longer here. Whatever. We need to find out, basically as an introspection, uh, what are the unresolved issues. So before I suddenly feel an untimely hunger urge, the world is used of snack attack. <laughs> when I get a snack attack, you know. So you can look back and what were the emotions before that? And by that you can say, okay, so this is this, this emotions. Where is the emotions coming from? So you know, okay, these are coming from there. So how can I deal with them? So the specific unresolved emotional issue, we may have to take some practical steps to deal with it. And if you find that Similar unresolved issues are what are troubling us again and again. Then we can, then we can uh, make a plan. Okay, when this happens, I can do one, two, three, and this way I can do. So using our introspection and our intuition, we can come up with steps for dealing with the unresolved emotional issue, and thus we can avoid the temptation or urge to avoid. Does that answer the question? Yes, but it's more share. Yeah, both. More more connection with Krishna and more addressing of that issue practically. Right. So next one? Yes. Uh, well, I have some questions, but uh, I don't know why you to you know, just go from here and then just go and talk about this shit. Uh, you can have two minutes. I'll say last one. Okay. Uh, I was wondering about the, you mentioned many things in order, like some tips here to deal with these six objects. And can you speak a little bit about your experience in, in temples, for instance, seeing different devotees uh, starting Krishna consciousness? Uh, where are the where are the main of hotels in some of dangers in, in the understanding of this verse because sometimes we, like Alex, you explained in, in terms of eating, you mentioned that it's not about the quantity, uh, how much you eat, but what you do after eating. Because sometimes we just uh, start judging, no? Or the, the author, oh, if the author is eating too much, or like that. But we, we take up a verse from the scriptures, but then it hampered us because uh, our understanding, the way we apply, it makes us offend devotees or, or we have the stereotypes of what should be an ideal devotee, but not necessarily the reality. So, so what are the ways in which the Nikram instruction first was can be misapplied? It can create an obstacle. So, let's just say, judging devotees uh, by the quantity of food that they eat. Yes, see, the main danger is making renunciation the standard of devotion. That means, this devotee is so renounced, therefore, this devotee must be very renounced. But, renunciation is, is a fruit of devotion. It is not a standard of devotion. So sometimes our renunciation, the, the, the purpose of renunciation is key, is that when there is renunciation, we can look up undistractedly at Krishna. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that same renunciation can make us look down proudly at others. So if I am fasting Mirjal on Ekadashi, and I go to the kitchen and see who all are eating. 
renunciation center instead of saying krishna center we just get extravagant we become proud we become judgmental towards others so so now we have to understand that renunciation is helpful in the practice of bhakti renunciation is important in the practice of bhakti but the essence is bhakti and another important thing to understand um is that some people will be still in the It means that they may, by their past karma, in this life or another life, they may be very simple. And for them to control the things, we are getting a little bit of it. And so, all renunciation is not necessary because of that. In the end, it's not really good. Just like we have six opportunities of Krishna, beauty, strength, health, fame, knowledge, renunciation. Now, some, if somebody is very beautiful, does that mean that they are great devotees? They can be, but beauty is not a sign of devotion. <laughs> beauty comes by past good karma. Strength can come by past good karma. Similarly, by past good karma, renunciation can also come. So, if, this, if some people have got renunciation in the past good karma, that is good because they just said, if somebody has wealth, they can use that wealth in Krishna's sense. You don't have to worry about earning money. Just similarly, if somebody has renunciation, they can use that renunciation in Krishna's service. But that renunciation alone itself is not necessarily a sign of it. It's not necessarily a fruit of it. So sometimes, uh, this doesn't mean that if somebody, some devotee is renouncing this thing, this is just by the past. <laughs> <laughs> we, should, we, should actually, we, should actually, we should always think in a way that helps us to stay home. If we see a devotee is renounced, I don't know. Maybe because of his own past karma, uh, past good upbringing, past act, good, good actions, or this is because of his own sin. But the point is, we just feel this thing that we want, but we don't have to make that devotion to renunciation as a standard by which we compare our devotion. Well, this devotion is for only five hours. I need seven hours. Therefore, I am useless. No, not me. What my body needs, I have to provide it. So, when we We will set other devotees, but we recognize that I am here to serve Krishna and I need to do whatever it takes to serve Krishna. Then we will regulate at our level and we move towards Krishna. Does that answer the question? Yes. You are the best partner. Right. Thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada. 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 Thank you.